Okay, um, I'm going to do a presentation on um, some tips and tricks that I have used with ArcOS to make my life a little easier. It may or may not help you, but um, this is roughly based on a presentation that I did at Warpstock the U.S. last year um, because I put this together on reasonably short notice. So hopefully not too many of you have seen it before. Uh, go ahead, n next slide. Okay, uh, preboot menu. Um, a couple of things that I always go in and change. Um, I don't have a USB DVD driver, so I always go in and change it so that I don't get that phantom drive in my drives folder for uh, USB. <clears throat> and if you are having drivers trap, it's real easy to edit the configure systems and go in and actually just rem out the driver. Of course, depending on what the driver is, if it's the hard drive, if it's uh, HZI or something like that, it's not going to do you much good. But, uh, but oftentimes you can do that and you can use um, either verbose boot, which is a setting in the pre-boot menu, which takes down, basically it takes down the logo so you can see everything load. Uh, huge amount of garbage on the screen mostly. And, or you can just use the Alt F2 which shows everything that loads after the um, logo comes down. Next slide. Um, the GPT or Luke's type drives, which a lot of new computers are going to have with Windows on them. You don't want to go anywhere near them with OS2, our basic OS2 disk utilities, because they think that the drive is empty. So guess what they do to the drive? Yeah, it basically repartitions and reformats everything, and you lose everything that was on that drive. Now, they, DFC and Airboot have been fixed to address this pretty well. So if you're using those types of tools, and hasn't even... Um, as far as I know from the revision history of ArcOS 502, there's a document in there, all the tools that are related. Fact, the, I think Mini-LVM will, when you have a GPU disk in your system... Mini-LVM mini is okay. And the disk utility is also fixed. It gives you a warning that there's a GPT. I think you can wipe the drive, but other than that, it won't yeah. do anything. So you should be safe. You, you are in theory safe, but like I said, if you're using LVM itself, be really careful. Because it potentially could be a problem. Well, in theory, it will never get to that point because when you start mini LVM and there's no DLAT sector put there by the disk utility. Right, you know, but, it, but if you start LVM itself, it doesn't check. In other words, I'm saying don't use the pure IBM shipped disk utilities. Well, but that will also not work. There's another safeguard because LVM doesn't see the DLAT sector. It will automatically flag the disk as being corrupt in LVM's opinion. Okay. And since the disk utility cannot add a DLAT sector since it sees a GPT partition, any edits that you will do when you exit LVM and you try to save it, it will tell you okay. it's corrupted disk. So that should also be locked down. So Hopefully. Because there are people who've actually destroyed disks historically with the tools. Um, peer networking, uh, one of the things you want to make sure, and I think this is going into the installer, is that you have to install NetBIOS or NetBIOS over um, TCPI um, because that's the only way it'll work. And those protocols don't get st installed by default. Right. Um, but uh, up until some time ago, you couldn't always scroll down on some system because of the bug in the installer, and you didn't see that message. Right. And if you don't see it or you just flat miss it, you're going to end up with peer installed and have no idea why it doesn't work. And that's why it doesn't work, it's because the, the network protocols aren't installed. Um, you can actually use peer networking and SAMBA at the same time, but then you have to use um, 
peer networking, you have to run it over straight NetBIOS because NetBIOS um, TCP IP basically uses the same addressing as Samba does, so they interfere with each other. But NetBIOS doesn't. Next slide. Can I ask something about that? Sure. I had not seen that. Okay, because I, <clears throat> I historically did this on ECS, which it would also work on Arc OS, but I haven't actually done it on Arc OS with Peer and Samba at the same time. Um, I recommend that you remove drivers that you don't need. They take up space, they change the timing. A lot of them don't even load in reality, they just go out and check. It speeds up the boot a little bit, um, maybe not real important. There are a lot of people that even if you're using the FAT32 driver that recommend that you don't use the cache, that it actually slows it down. Um, my USB ports are so slow that I wouldn't notice. Um, the only thing you want to make sure you don't do is remove duplicate um, base USB drivers because each of your controllers has to have a driver. So if you have four controllers of one of those types, and of course UB, USB X HZD is simply hopefully going to be out soon. It is being developed. Okay, go ahead. Um, if you're running Protect Only, which means you don't install DOS or Windows, um, if you install Peer and all the networking stuff, all of the virtual drivers for DOS get installed. It doesn't pay any attention to this. So you need to go in and cut them out. Don't take DOS systems out, though, because that one you need to run even on protect mode. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, um, it, does, it does a lot of things. In other words, it's not directly related to DOS. I just mention it because obviously it looks like it is based on its name. Um, shells. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, disagree. Um, I, I do the same in the reverse direction. I just got an iconic click up there to open 402, which is whatever I do whenever I need to do some command line stuff. And I leave cmd.exe as the standard one and you eliminate all these problems popping up randomly because things are not designed to work with. For instance, the ver slash r command gives different data. And so in some installers go, no, no, I can't use that. It's the, the real difference is the way they do command line ex expansion. So if uh, some command lines on 4 OS 2 expand to something different than what they expand on CMD, and that's what, what basically causes all these problems. A lot of them have been addressed in the latest 4 OS 2, but it still has its problems. And I'll be honest with you, I don't use it as my default shell anymore. I, I have two CMD wrappers that I use um, which I simply run afterwards. So if I go back, my environment off of the desktop is CMD. My environment off of everything else is 4OS2. I just change the, the shell commands. But this is just a list of some of the things that I've run across that, that are problems. ANP in, install doesn't work. Um, Arkhamapper has a bunch of problems, but this is one of them. Um, <clears throat> And um, some of the VM Rex programs will throw weird error messages, even though a lot of times they'll work. You'll get um, a collection of error message boxes. So you're just better off probably using CMD as your default. Next slide. A uh, com few command line switches. On most things, um, you probably don't need much in the way of command line switches. Um, 
the new, this is the new FAT32, the dot 10. Um, and as you can see, EAs, it has been intermittently broken across versions, maybe broken in every one of the versions, except that I can't identify that it is. So probably, unless you have a real specific reason for needing it, you probably don't want to use it. Um, the, the slash fat gives you VFAT support, which, are, which is just fat only with long file names, which is kind of a nice feature. That one is included in the um, Arc OS version. Um, the XFAT, which is an experimental in this, and is Microsoft's patented FAT version. It's not available in Arc OS, and it's because of the Microsoft patents and licensing. Um, <clears throat> you can try adding to the AHCI driver the slash N slash F. Um, it does speed up disk access for some people in some systems, and no one has reported a problem with using it. That doesn't mean there isn't a problem, but it's something you might want to try. A virtual address limit, um, I've heard a lot of different things that range from what I've got up there from 10 to 1024 to 3072. Uh, 1536, I think, is the default in um, Arc OS. Um, it's probably, if you're running a lot of things, a lot of big programs like um, OpenOffice and um, the Mozilla apps and stuff like that, you probably need to kick it up at least to 2048. <clears throat> uh, next slide. Okay, one of the interesting things that I discovered um, I often I would change DOS from low, no, UMB to high UMB. I use DOS for a decompiler. A lot of people, obviously, this has no effect on because you're probably not going to be using DOS. But I found out that it traps if that device driver has the slash UMB switch on it. And I have no idea why. Because if you've got it set both places, if I take the switch off, and put high UMB, it works. If I use low, no UMB, and put, the slat, and put the switch on, it works. But if both of them, it traps. So if you make some change to your DOS settings and have an odd trap, that's probably, it's probably related to that. I like using vcompat. It's one of the things that allows DOS to see drives that are bigger than two gigabytes. That's one of the things it does. It actually does some timing stuff for some old, old DOS games and a few other things that are nice. Um, there is another driver, which name escapes me, if all you're interested in is the two gigabyte, larger than two gigabyte drive support. Um, and I use for DOS and as far as I can tell, it doesn't have any of the problems that 4OS2 does with things not working. Next slide. Um, the DOS video issues, where your DOS window comes up and says that this video is not supported. I don't remember the exact error message. Um, there's a lot of things you can try. The VSVGA.sys uh, with the interrupt 10, whatever that is whatever the rest of the stuff is ending in safe um, is the one that most reliably works. You have to put that into config.system and then you need to add mode CO80 and then on a separate line COS to the auto execute bat. And that on my system, for example, works. It does not fix it on every system. There are some other things you can try. As you can see, there's a huge number of command line switches that actually exist for these things. Um, I think it was you, Roderick, that told me that basically people have tried most of them without much success when you were working on ECS, other than the one that works. Switch 
speeches, they will probably not help to address the, uh, the issue. But they, they represent something you could try. That's about the best. There are a few reports that the V, VGA cis or the VXGA cis actually fixes it. This right. This is this is a fix for Windows. It's not for full screen. Full screen works. Any computer that you can fix the window with this full screen works. At least as far as I know. Um, so and the other trick is sometimes you can open the full screen and then just switch it to a window, and that will work. In other words, you don't get the error message when you take the full screen down to a window. I don't know that it works 100% of the time, but it also works on some computers where this switch doesn't. So there are several different approaches to try to work around this. Next slide. Um, the other thing is, is that there have been reports that WinOS 2 some of them where DOS works and WinOS 2 doesn't work. If you go in, there are four DOS video ses settings, and there have been reports of various ones of those being toggled either on or off, depending on if they're on, you toggle them off, and if they're off, you toggle them on, which actually fixes the WinOS 2 problem. Next slide. Um, some people like to sort their configure systems. I personally do. I think uh, Doug's logical config sort is a nice tool. Um, obviously, other people don't. I haven't had any problems with his tool breaking anything. Um, obviously, there are some order things within config.sys. He understood what most of them were and has gotten them right. I assume there is probably some odd driver out there that he knows nothing about that could become a problem. I do know one thing, that if you're adding um, a new um, comm driver, network driver, and you try to add it into the additional, your personal drivers, it gets added in the wrong order. Because uh, they either all get added first or last. I think it's last, and that's not where that driver needs to be because then there is no card driver as the rest of the network drivers try to add. But that's, that's the only one I'm aware of, and of course that's kind of an odd one. Um, I also use the config tool, which obviously some of its suggestions are pretty outdated but some of the things it suggests and some of the things it'll show you are actually still valuable. Next slide. Um, my say mouse versus S mouse. I think S mouse is the only thing that you really need to use it on is ThinkPads. And I run a mouse on my ThinkPad and it works just fine. But some people have had problems with it on ThinkPads with the track point and stuff. And if you do, Obviously, the thing, the thing I would recommend is install with a mouse, and then if you do encounter mouse errors, switch back to IBM single mouse driver. Multipoint EXE, it's loaded by wfconfig.dll, which is part of the single mouse driver. As far as I can tell, with a mouse loaded, it does nothing but take up low memory and eat CPU cycles. Because it's, it's a, it pulls. You can see that if you look at it in um, top or something like that. It's a polling driver. I always just simply rename it. Um, it IBM, in its infinite wisdom, did not provide any way to prevent it from being loaded, other than renaming it or something of that equivalent. 
If you're going to do that and switch to the single mouse driver, though, remember you did that because you're going to have to rename it back. Otherwise, the single mouse driver won't work. One small comment about mice. If you connect them to a USB socket, that is calling. If you connect them to the PS1 socket, that's interrupting. Well, I, what I'm saying is multipoint is scroll is is polling for something yeah. or throwing interrupts. I, I can't tell you what. It's eating CPU cycles is what I can tell you. And um but that's what I'm saying is purely a hardware thing, you know. Right, but if, if I take multipoint out, I don't see it. In other words, it's not like something else does it. Next slide. There's by the way one other nasty thing that people should know when running S mouse in conjunction on a pretty modern system with ACPI, if the system uh, is running in, uh, in APIC mode, as in you have more than 15 interrupts, uh, in, on some laptops, a mouse, uh, S mouse from IBM will crash the system and start up because it can't handle more than 15 interrupts for whatever awful reason. So Kay. that's another reason why on more modern laptops, you, I think a trap was reported once uh, that on the T60 or T61, I think it's pretty long ago, the crash would occur if you would install S mouse. So yeah, I think it was a T60. Um, <clears throat> there, Arc OS has a new loader, and it has a couple of nice features. Mm -hmm. One, you can create a RAM disk which uses any memory you have a, above the four gigabyte limit, and. For example, my desktop has four gigabytes of memory in it. I can still create a 500 megabyte drive that is using memory that otherwise would never be used because there's that much that is taken out of that four gigabytes by ROMs and other things that are getting loaded. So even, even with four gigabytes, this is, this is valuable. Um, I, I put my temp file on it and those commands the run this and the two set commands is simply what I put in um, my um, config.sys and that way it creates the the temp directory on my drive Z which is obviously the RAM disk I'm using and then sets every then points everything to it you can put the print spooler on it and there's a there's a box that you can check where on a on a warm reboot it will try to preserve what's on that disk so that you can use it following a warm reboot. Obviously, a cold reboot ain't going to help, but uh, I've not tried that, so I don't know how well it does it. Obviously, that becomes important for the spooler if you, know, you crash in the middle of a print job. You really don't want to lose what's in the spooler as part of that. The other thing you could actually put on it is a swap file, and I've done that, and it works. The, problem you, the only problem you have is the swap file has to be put in the root because this trick of making a directory for whatever reason doesn't work. And I think it's just because the swap file gets initialized too early in the boot process for this to work. But you can put the swap file up there. So you could use the memory for that also. Of course, I don't think I've gone to swap even running OpenOffice and Mozilla apps and stuff like that. I don't think I've gone to my swap file in years, so may not help much. Um, it also has the ability to, um, you can put a mem limit in, and the advantage to that is if you're, if you're trying to get a trap dump, um, obviously, creating a four gigabyte uh, FAT drive is a little tough. There is a tool, a dump FS, which is uh, really not ready for prime time. It was released as a beta by Scott Garfield as one of the last things that he put out. Um, but this allows you this allows you to use a two gigabyte or even smaller FAT drive as your dump partition because all the memory you have is 512. Now, you don't want to obviously run like this because that's literally all the memory you have. It just makes it so, so that the system cannot see the rest of the memory. It just sees the 512. Or you can lo limit it to 1024 or to 2048, depending on 
This is also a lot easier for whoever's going to have to analyze that tramp dump because they've got a lot less stuff to go through than they would have if, if you've got your four gigabytes of memory. Next slide. The note on both the, um, what I put up there is what you would put into the OS2 loader, well, it's LDR.config, is those lines. There are two um, GUI tools in Arc OS, um, one of them called memlimit, and you can just type memlimit at a command line um, because it's in the path. And then actually in the setup folder is the one to create, it's called RAM disk, and it's the one to create the RAM disk. And basically all they are are front ends that create that loader configuration file. X Center. Um, just a few things. Uh, I always switch to L Switcher immediately. I just get rid of the win list. You could theoretically run the standalone version of L Switcher and leave the win list in. Um, I've never actually tried it, but there would be no reason to prevent it. You can't run both the standalone L Switcher and L Switcher and X Center at the same time because there can only be one version of L-Switcher running. Um, <clears throat> I always remove the unused plugins. The consideration here is that um, all of those, all of, X, all of X Workplace runs as part of the PM process. It's part of the system. So it's, it's increasing the memory and the complexity of what is already the most complex part. When X Center opens, whether the plugin is installed or not, if it is in the directory, that plugin gets loaded. So it is taking up memory, if nothing else. Um, XW Land is kind of the worst because when you close X Center, supposedly all of these get unloaded. For whatever reason, it doesn't unload. So that's one of the ones, unless you need it for Wi-Fi, that you probably want to go in and rename. The easiest thing to do is just go in the directory and all the ones you're not using, just rename them. Because as soon as you, they're no longer a D, DLL extension, it doesn't try to load them. And so that saves the memory. And then if you decide later you want to use it, you just have to go in and rename it back and install it. Um, I always add it to the screen border so that you can just go down to the screen border and it opens X Center. That can be done two ways. The X Center settings itself has a checkbox that says add to, to the screen border. And then you can actually go into the pager screen page where you can throw it in as going to that border. Next slide. Um, the full X workplace has a couple of features that the uh, Arkanoa one does not. The reboot two choices, in other words, you can re when you've just got the Arkanoa one, you have your choice of reboot or of shutdown. With the full version, you have reboot, reboot two, which is you can actually tell it, okay, I want to reboot to whichever partition you want to work on. Um, with Airboot, at least the last that I looked, the nice little menu where it tells you what to put in to set the reboot isn't there, but it's real simple to do. All you do is put set boot slash IBA and then the colon and then in parentheses is whatever the name of the partition is. And even if it didn't show on the list, it works just fine. Um, <clears throat> turbo folders is not included. Turbo folders is kind of problematic in that it changes the way that the associations work. It associates, the, the way that they natively work is they're associated by filter. This changes it so they're associated by type. But in order for that to work, the filters have to be under the type 
So you have to actually go in and associate the filters with all the type. It does add a page where you can do that. Um, associate edit, edit, which I think is a very nice little tool, is what I actually use to do that if I'm playing with that. I'm not sure that Turbo Folders brings you any advantage that is worth the hassle that it, with the association changes. The other thing that you get is the um, settings object, so you can turn various things within X Workplace on and off if that's something that you wish to do. That settings is not available in the Arcanoa one. Next slide. Um, Arcamapper. Arcamapper has some issues. Um, one of the ones that is really kind of confusing is, um, is auto start. There are actually two ways to automatically restart the shares. You can either use NetDrive's persistent setting, which is the one I recommend. Auto start is crap as far as I'm concerned. Um, auto start has the following problems. One, most of the time you will get an error that one or more of your shares is not available, which I find very interesting because if I use drive persistence, what I will get from auto start if I had it installed at the same time is the error telling me the share is already installed, which means drive persistence goes first and manages to find them all. Um, it doesn't uninstall gracefully. All it does is throw an error message that says I couldn't uninstall myself. It's pretty easy to uninstall because you can simply pull it out of the startup folder and that fixes it, but it's still one of those things where you'd like to see that it does that. Um, <clears throat> the auto persistence, what you do is you need to do it before you do anything with mounting volumes. Um, you want to change persist volume configuration to volumes configure or whatever name you are using for your volumes because you can actually set that to something else. This is the default name. And then to do that, you just unremark it or you add it to the NDCLT configure file, which is in wherever NDFS is. And it's under that, it's under your boot drive programs, NDFS, if it's, an, if it's a default Arcano install. Um, the other annoying thing about auto start is minimized means that you have a throbber that covers about half your screen that runs until all of the drives have been restored or until it's thrown the 12 error messages that it's going to throw about the fact it can't find them. Um, next. Um, if you try to install shares from servers where all you have are net BIOS names, it won't find them. What you have to do is you have to put in your host file that net BIOS name and then the IP address. Now, if you have a local dynamic name server, that fixes it. Um, you would have to use the host names, though, for any of the IP addresses. Obviously, if you're using DHCP and there's a reason to believe that your server's IP address might change, you have to do one of a couple of things. Um, well, you could set up a name server. You can actually almost all of the DHCP servers can be told that always give this IP address to this MAC address. Or you could set up your server as a static address. I think most of the DHCP servers, the highest address they will give is the one just below the last, the first static. So you want the static address to be way high up if you're setting it with a static and everything else is on DHCP. Um, we talked a little bit about 4LS2. Um, some of the SAMBA processes end up uh, essentially running amok and the only way to take care of that is to just go out and kill them. Right now, the advanced mount options, which are Kerbos 5, um, which um, encryption system you're using, and a couple of other things, um, they're all selected by default. And of course, interestingly, they're mutually exclusive. 
So um, not real helpful. Uh, basically, you just, and their location is unintuitive. If you're going through the front page, which is the, the shares page, it's on the second page of that tab. If you're going through the neighborhood network page, it's actually on a dialog box that you pull up. So they're not in the same place. Um, fortunately, with the, well, next slide. Okay, one of the strange things about it is Archimapper doesn't load the settings from Samba Configure. In other words, what's there is its default, not what's in your Samba Configures dot, dot config. So if I go in and fix those advanced settings to whatever I really need and then save it, that's in my Samba config, config. But the next time I open this, they will still all be checked. So it looks like it hasn't been fixed, when in fact it really actually has been fixed. That's true for basically all the settings in there. So you really don't, you want to set it up once, and then you don't want to write to the settings again unless you are intentionally changing those settings. Because it will blithely overwrite whatever you had already had in there and change it to whatever happens to be checked or not checked in these various boxes. Um, okay, network printing isn't supported through Archimapper. You can do network printing a couple of ways. Obviously, CUPS is probably the obvious one for anybody that has a CUPS printer. That works pretty smoothly. I happen to have an old HP laser jet that I can't get working with CUPS. And I found that there's an SMB printer port, which is shipped with Arc OS. You just need to install that printer port. It's easy to install with the print manager. And then just essentially print to that port. Uh, one of the odd things about it is the, FMP, uh, the SMB print EXE doesn't work with parallel ports. In other words, it's great if, you're, if the printer is attached to the USB port, probably works great if it's actually a, a network attached. Um, but I did find that I can actually change that configuration and substitute print EXP, and it'll print it just fine to a parallel port. The only problem with that is it doesn't get rid of the spool files. And unfortunately, that fills up, unless you have a huge drive, fills up a drive pretty quickly. But I did finally just write a command file that goes in and deletes all those spool files in the middle of the night so that that all works. Huh? I'll put it on the wrong disk. Yeah, I, that, I, could, I could probably do that. Okay, high memory. Um, you know, it'd be nice to be able to use all that extra memory above 512 um, for applications and stuff like that, which is the original limit in OS2. Uh, the Mozilla apps, OpenOffice, and Clam AV. At minimum, you should probably use high mem or at least try using high mem. They do cause, there are reports of some stability problems and some other strange hangs and stuff like that on some systems with this. But I think you're better off trying it because there are a lot of reports when you don't use it of memory just getting completely eaten up. Um, you can either do it with high mem exe, which is actually included with, uh, with OpenOffice, or um, exe header exe, which is installed on Arc OS, and you can just type it at the command line because it's in the path. And just, you know, type it with a slash question mark, and it will tell you what you need to do. Again, a warning's about the stability. And the answer to why not everything. The problem is that there are 20 some odd um, OS or um, of the interface commands like, you know, DOS open. I don't think DOS open is actually one of them, but that are not high memory compatible. So all of the old programs that were written from the straight from the toolkit without wrappering those, they won't work. 
They won't even run in high memory. You just get error messages if you get anything. So that's why you really can't load things that haven't been specifically designed to be loaded high. We even tried to get FM2 to work loaded high and wrappered all the problems and everything like that. And we never did succeed in getting it to reliably stably, sta be stable and work high. We could get it to load high and work, but it would crash and do other things that it didn't do when it was loaded low. So that's, that's why you don't want to just go out and blithely start setting everything, all your executables to run high. <laughs> Next slide. Um, if you want to hide your floppy drive icons, this is how you do it. You just go to the include tab of the drives folder and you just exclude them. And it will take them out of the drives folder so you don't have those two on mo at what on most systems at least are just meaningless icons. You can do it in FM2 with, by adding this to the command line, the slash AB um, space percent star um, and just something to beautify your system. Next. Uh, one of the things that's in Arc OS that probably is missed is clock sync. Um, you can sync it to the national time standards. It's got a bunch of choices as to which one so you can pick the one closest to you. Um, it uses a program called Daytime as its back end. And if you go in here and set your time zone, in other words, if for whatever reason your time zone didn't get set properly, you can just hit change and it'll actually write it to config.sys. I found that mine was never getting updated. And the problem was simply that it would take long enough to make the link to the router wireless so that the delay time was insufficient and the time uh, in minutes was set for 12 hours. So it would, come, it would start up, it would wait, it couldn't make the connection, and 12 hours later it was already shut down for the day, so it never upset, it reset the time. So there's a setting for the turn on delay. And I just set that for two minutes instead of one minute, and the problem went away. Okay. But that's unrelated to, you know, yeah, well, but it, it could be a problem for other people. Uh, next slide. Um, IFX is an, a little any cleaner that is included in Arc OS. It uh, gets rid of dead um, file handles, basically. It does have the ability to back up and restore, and it does back up. Each time that it cleans it, it also backs up the old ones, so in case it did break something, you can actually restore that file. Um, obviously, it's not a replacement for any cleaners or checkers. Next slide. Um, these are some of the ones that are out there. Check any, clean any, Unimate, and um, Rick Walsh's um, um, remote workplace shell commands. It has things like um, icon edit, where you can add, where you can remove uh, bogus icons and stuff like that. So it's not an any cleaner or checker in the classic sense, but it gives you the ability to go in yourself and remove stuff that you. In other words, some programs will do strange things, like they will load their icon into the any file when in truth that's their icon anyways. So it's just taking up space in the any file for no particularly good reason. So you can remove some of those. And do you know what the biggest offender for putting icons in, in OS2 any is? It's Unimain. All of its CMD files put, put their icons into, the, into OS2 any. So, that's, that's the one problem that I have with Unimate. Um, it's actually, you can actually now just download it and um, use it without a license. Um, and clean any and check any. Uh, the first two are the two that I actually use to any great extent. 
I do have Unimate, but I don't use it that much. Next, um, some other useful utilities, at least in my view. Uh, clip view, I think, is really a must-have utility. It just gives you a list of, of clips. You can have up to 21, and you can actually run multiple ones of these, um, which gives you the ability on the other ones you're running to actually lock the different things into it for things that you use very regularly. You know, if you want if your name, for example, so you can just go in and pick it and, and go ahead and just paste it in. Um, One thing that's very, well, not very easy with clip view is adding extra lines into it. Because you have to go clip, add, get a new line, clip, add, and it moves up. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing you can do is there is a sw command line switch, which is, I think, dash capital A, which tells it um, to save after each clip being added. It was something that was important to me because I would get a bunch of stuff set up in it for something I was doing as for development. And then I'd do something with the development and I'd crash the system. And I'd have to go back in because, because originally it only saved when you closed it. But so that's a nice feature, particularly if you, like me, do something that crashes the system regularly. Uh, <laughs> probably says something about my code, but uh, um, screen capture utility is something that's missing. Gotcha. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but I've actually started, I've redeveloped it to, um, to be a full replacement for the print screen for when you hit print screen, so that it'll simply save this instead of printing to a printer, which I think very few people in this day and age are really interested in from print screen. It saves it to a file, it, it will do it quietly, or it will give you the option of picking a file name, it will give you all kinds of options. In other words, anybody who's used Gotcha, it has the potential to give you all the choices with Gotcha, which include picking a window, picking a window interior, just simply roping off a section of the screen or picking the whole screen. Um, it will default to full screen if you just want it to do it silently. You can save the clipboard, print screen, um, and shift print screen actually print it to a file. Control print screen will print it to um, the clipboard. And alt print screen pulls up its settings so you can change any of those things that you might like to change. And this gotcha screen that you see here, which is, is how you do it, this is the old one, obviously, because I was too lazy to rebuild it and didn't have a copy of the new one. Um, the, that screen is actually the front of the settings screen so that you can actually then manually do a print screen capture if that's what you want to do out of the settings notebook. It doesn't. Because if you want something that also includes a mouse pointer, uh, scan camera, it's also available on Office. So if you want to have a, for a particular reason, uh, a print screen with the cursor showing pointing to something for documentation, you can use scan camera. Yeah. And can you actually also print the screen? You mean to the printer? Yeah. No. Yeah, you can. You can close it, and then you get IBM's print screen back. Okay. <laughs> so, so yes, you can, <laughs> just not with it. Right. Um, then other things is, I think L-Switcher should be installed by default, but of course I develop L-Switcher, so <laughs> I'm probably biased. In other words, I think you should replace the Windows tray with it. Um, NCFTP is a very nice replacement for the command line. IBM gives you large file support. 
other things, it's a little easier to use. And then I would like to see a simple calendar. And by that I mean, you know, the one, like the one you would hang on a wall. I don't want it to save my appointments. I don't want anything. I just want to be able to find out what the date is next Tuesday. <clears throat> and there really aren't any that I've been able to find. There's, there's, yeah, it's not a, it's not just a calendar though. It's not just a calendar, but if you don't do anything else with it, you end up with a calendar. Yeah. It has one known bus. You've got a week that begins, so there's only four lines in February, leap year, okay? It goes nuts. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, right, you know. There's one year that passed, like, oh, that's kind of nice. But other than that, things can work. Yeah, and of course you have to have YBM works. Of course. Um, but, but the, um, also, there's a couple of Java calendars out there that are actually basically that also, which is what I actually use as J calendar. Uh, one more slide, I think, is all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>